everyone, and welcome to day four of the STEM Summit. I'm excited that today we have the Let's Talk STEM Outreach panel session, and you can always spend time at our STEM Outreach Expo. Before we begin, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping. The event is broken into stages, sessions, networking, and an exhibit hall, and you can navigate those on the left-hand menu. All sessions are being recorded for later viewing in the replay section. And during the presentation today, we hope you can post your speaker questions into the chat, and that's to the right of the event window. Make sure to participate in the STEM Summit Challenge to win some prizes. You can find the link in the Summit reception page, and the winners will be announced at the Expo on Friday. Now, the Expo Hall is open and, and will remain open throughout the week. Exhibitors will be live on Friday from 11 to 1. Join the continued STEM outreach conversation on our Collaboratech and Facebook communities. We really wanna build our community, so let's support one another over on those social media channels. And be sure to bring your family to the, the Family Build on Saturday, where we will be building a structure to withstand a critical load. That should be an exciting time. Now I'd like to introduce the today's panel session moderator, Bert Ditt. Bert is the director of IEEE Student and Academic Education Programs, and he is a passionate um, STEM outreach volunteer himself. So I'm gonna bring Bert on to get the panel started. Thanks so much, Donna. Uh, Thanks. Welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know we've got a lot of participants from all over the world. So we're glad to have you for this STEM outreach panel session. And as Donna mentioned, I'm part of the IEEE staff. So it's been one of my pleasures to work with all of our panelists today. And during this session, we're, they are gonna be sharing some of their experiences in STEM outreach from engaging you know, the students, teachers, the various challenges they've had, uh, how they overcame them, strategies for engaging diverse populations, best practices, other advice that you will be able to use if you're a volunteer doing STEM outreach, if you're a teacher interested in doing STEM in your classroom, or even students themselves. So we are excited about today's panel. And our distinguished panel, I'm not gonna go through a big bio. You probably can read all that information. I can tell you right now that these individuals have a great record of STEM outreach, both in IEEE and outside IEEE. So you're gonna be hearing a lot of great advice and great information. So let me introduce our panel. And going across the screen there, I'll start with uh, Stramat uh, Stamatis Drug. Dragu I'm sorry, Stamatis, I, me I messed up your last name. But uh, Stamatis Dragomus, Yut Kwan Lee, who we call Cheryl, Connie Kelly, and Pia Torres. And all of them, again, have a great experience in STEM outreach. I think you're going to find the discussion really exciting and really informative and also fun. So our format for today is we'll be doing some opening remarks. Then I will be taking the panel through a series of questions. It's more of a case study relating to a, a type of program they might have offered. And then we'll open it up to the audience questions. So as Donna mentioned, use the chat function, put your questions in as we go along. Uh, and then at the end, we'll just close and, and uh, summarize what we did today. And hopefully you'll have found this to be a very valuable experience. So why don't we get right into our discussion and bring our panel live now? And it looks like they are all here. Hi, everybody. Great to see you. Hello. We're glad you can join us and take time out of your busy schedule. I know all of you have been involved with STEM outreach. You're actually a lot of you have a lot of experience even working with our pre-university education coordinating committee uh, and doing a lot of things related to STEM. So 
Uh, I'm going to ask you a little bit about your backgrounds. And to start off with the questions, uh, it's kind of a two-part question. The first part is, we know there are things that can spark excitement and wonder in students. Uh, that's why we're doing this. And we try to do that in the most effective way. For me, it was the Apollo program that got me excited. So I'm going to ask you to just share what got you interested in STEM uh, and led you down this career path. And then also as a second part to that, how did you get involved in IEEE and STEM outreach? So it's a two-part question. And what I think I'll do is I think I'm going to start with Pia. Okay, thank you very much, Morton. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. So it's an honor also to, to share this time with my, the rest of the panelists uh, who are who really I, I admire because of the great job they have been doing. Well, I'm from Argentina. I started my journey in IEEE the, the same year that I started studying electronics and um, um, engineering in university. I was trying to fit in, in some kind of group because I was one of the only female students in that area. So I was trying to meet people, try to feel more confident about my studies. Uh, so I joined IGP, the student branch there. Uh, that was in 2001. And when I, I have been a volunteer since then, uh, first as a student member, then as a um, graduate member, and then and nowadays I'm a senior member in IGP. And since uh, IGP has been part of my professional and student life for a lot of years, uh, I have done a lot of activities. But especially uh, the STEM outreach activities, it started when I joined the professional group of women engineering when I moved uh, to Buenos Aires. Uh, that was in 2015. Uh, we were trying to do different activities to try to attract especially women uh, in STEM activities. Uh, the first idea was asking uh, in the group of uh, ladies that belong to that group, uh, what was the, 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 the idea that, or the first activity that you have done to get, get interest in STEM? And most of us, we have this uh, first experience play with some special game or toy, or maybe because we were inspired for uh, by our parents or someone else. So the, the first idea was to create something for kids to try to inspire them. And we uh, started with these activities uh, with mixed um, diverse teams, not only girls, girls and boys, 50 and 50%, and to try to involve them and inspire them to to be interested in STEM activities, but also to have technology as a tool to change the world. Uh, so it has been a long year at, uh, time till now. I'm very passionate about STEM. I love to work with children and, and teenagers because I think I can uh, help them and inspire them also to change the world with technology. So that was my, my, my start and I'm really passionate about that. Um, you can tell, thank you so much, Pia. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Cheryl, tell us your story. Oh, Cheryl, you're on mute there. Oh, you still on mute, Cheryl. Oh. Nope, still can't hear you. Should I switch up? I don't know, while you're fixing that uh, technical issue there, we'll go to Stamatis. Okay. Well, that's an interesting question. You know what? When I try to think when I was first introduced into STEM, I go back and then I realize that I have to go even more <laughs> uh, when I was even younger and younger. And, and then I realized that all my life <laughs> I've been, you know, uh, into STEM. And the experience I can remember clear was that I was on the fifth grade, I was introduced into um, software development, like uh, I, we were doing Logo back then. You know, back then the, the personal computers were not, uh, were just were, were just introduced. So it was a big thing, you know. So uh, that was the, my first experience. I know I was excited about that, about that and then two, three years later, my father got me to a, a fair and he bought me my first personal computer. It was a Commodore 64. And, and uh, I was, of course, I started playing games, which is obvious. 
And then the first thing I started to do was to start creating my own games. And th that was that was it. As far as I remember myself, I always wanted to be a software engineer. Due to the Greek uh, educational system, I, I went to become chemical engineer, but the, the you know, that the virus was there. And when I uh, graduated, uh, my, my dissertation project was computational fluid dynamics. And I, I knew that I'm interested in coding and, and creating things. I mean, the creativity you, you express by doing such thing is, is what drives me in, in, into STEM. And it's the, the aspect I try to emphasize in uh, my students too. So then after chem being chem uh, dissertated, I got into uh, uh, software engineering and here I am. Uh, I was teaching uh, coding and data structures and that kind of stuff uh, since 2003. And what really got me into uh, IEEE and STEM outreach was the, 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 when I was, I was uh, a adjunct lecturer in uh, uh, technical institute uh, in uh, an island uh, near me in, in Lefkada where i was i was piloting uh, or was i was researching on uh, uh, how to uh, enhance uh, project based learning in order to uh, make it even even more uh, interesting and how to uh, let my students express their their needs and their will what what they would like to become in the future and that and i realized that this uh, can be really productive when being in, in such an institute like IEEE where you can have all the networking you, you like, you can have all the help you, you like, the expertise, etc. Actually, my students paid my first membership fee <laughs> and I became a member. And since then, uh, I'm into STEM with all my heart. A very good semantic. It's clear from just Hearing your story and Pia's story, everyone has a little bit different approach to what got them interested. So, so Cheryl, it looks like everything's working again. Uh, Want to share your story? Right. Uh, thank you, Bert, and the organizing committee of the inaugural IEEE uh, STEM Summit for the invitation. Um, I'm Cheryl from IEEE Malaysia section. A very good day to all, and also happy Diwali or the Festival of Lights to all Hindu attendees. Um, I sort of, um, it, it, it's, you can call it a destiny. Uh, my parents put me in, a, in the Montessori type of kindergartens, which do a lot of hands-on activities. And then when I was in the um, primary and the high school, I was always the president of the science club and i have to find i have to organize activities hands-on activities like uh, building a rocket and things like that uh, for my club members and this continues through my undergraduate years where i still uh, sort of join into the club of uh, you know building an airplane and things like that um so um when it comes to uh IHPE, um maybe it's the only way i know i can give back i've always volunteered for the education activities uh portfolio or ea for short for as the excom of the technical societies and also the wie embraced with the experience i then run for a excom position in the ieee malaysia section i was lucky to get elected and re-elected for four years and it is obvious which portfolio was I, I was holding as the section ea coordinator i was lucky to be invited to the ieee uh, and also regional committees to do with ea and exchanges at this meeting make me understand more in depth about teacher in service program or tisp the forefather of STEM and also other functions of EA. And at grassroots, I also met many interesting people 
particularly a few resourceful teachers who requested my help for the design and technology subject, a new subject just introduced into the school syllabus to teach um, renewable energy, electrical and digital circuit, simple programming and the like in a hands-on approach. The teachers were expected to facilitate, but they were unprepared for the disruption. Mm -hmm. And what I have learned at the uh, EA board, the EA board tips workshop became valuable. I sat down with the teachers to select suitable tri engineering lessons, recruited and uh, trained IEEE member and student volunteers, purchased material, arranged with the school, and delivered the lessons. And somehow, these activities caught the attention of the director of STEM Center, Ministry of Education. My presentation to him um, has um, made the visibility of IEEE tips to about 5,000 Ministry of Education staff, um, principals, teachers, parents, and students through exhibition, forums, and workshop. For which, with much gratitude, I was awarded with the 2019 IEEE EA Board um, Meritorious Achievement Award in Pre-University Education. And with my team, in, we received the 2019 IEEE Region 10 Outstanding Group Education Activities Award. And that is from me. Thank you. Over back to you. Thank you, Cheryl. Wow, fabulous. And I think you key on a, a really important area that maybe we'll touch on shortly about how to help teachers get more prepared. So because they are incredibly important in inspiring and influencing uh, these students as well. So. Let me go to our final panelist, uh, Connie. Let's hear a little bit about your story. Well, my story started very, very young. Um, when I was a kid, I had a mild case of polio. So I didn't do a lot of outdoor activities for a very long time. And since my family didn't have a television or a telephone, if you can imagine that, uh, I was left to cope with books and with nothing else to do, I quickly burnt through the entire children's section and they put me in the young adult section at a very early age. And at the age of seven, I read a book called K. Everett Calls CQ. Now, if you're a ham, you already know what I'm talking about. It was about a young girl who got involved in amateur radio and I was hooked. By the time I was eight, I had an active ham license, and I still have a ham license today. And more surprisingly, I still have the book that started it all. Well, I got into some gifted student programs at Illinois Institute of Technology by the time I was 11. And when I was 16, one of my male cousins got into something called Civil Air Patrol, which was an Air Force aviation program for youth. And anything he could do, I could do better. So I quickly joined and I ended up going to IIT. I've done aviation and electronics and communications literally my entire life. And since I was having so much fun, why not share the, the wealth? I became involved in student outreach programs when I was at IIT. I was both a student there and I taught a few semesters. And uh, I got it. I was a member of IEEE, but I didn't really get terribly active outside of IIT until they formed an engineering and medicine and biology chapter in my section. And somehow, I guess I missed a meeting. I ended up the chair and started going to the Chicago section meetings. And 
within a couple years, I ended up the chair of Chicago section. And when I stepped down, I thought, you know, I, I don't really want to just disappear into the sunset. There's got to be something else I can do. So I became the education chair. And IEEE was starting to get involved in STEM activities at the time. Uh, real STEM outreach didn't get a lot of play until the late 90s, early 2000s. And we would we did a, um, a STEM expo at IIT, of course, where all the different engineering societies came out on a Saturday during Engineers Week and brought exhibits and talked to students and tried to convince students that their brand of engineering was the best. And it seemed a shame that we only had Expo one day a year. It seemed like there was more we could do to, to uh, reach students with engineering. So a small group of us within Chicago actively search out venues where we can do Expo type activities and get kids involved, whether it's in the park district or at schools themselves or churches. In fact, we've even done engineering activities at the Taste of Chicago, which is a huge, huge music festival. We, we've had activities where uh, every day we did a different engineering activity and the kids who came to the festival, uh, a lot of times their parents would park a, them in what was called then the family village. They, they don't do it anymore, which is a real shame. But uh, And we would have these, you know, we would vie with members of the Chicago Blackhawks and Disney Radio for kids' attention. And quite frequently, we would win out because while it was fun to stand in line to get an autograph or stand there and watch a, uh, a Disney Radio performer, at our tent, you could actually do something and have a lot of fun doing it and have something to take home. And one last story, one year, oh, about 10 years ago, it was 96 degrees and the humidity was 96 and we were all dying and we were making foam rockets with the kids. And a little boy who had to have been 11, 12 at the most, came up and said, ma'am, is it okay if I do the activity? Because I did it last year. And I said, no, of course, you know, we, we don't check up. You're, you know, have fun. You're welcome here. And he looked at me and said, I did the activity last year and I figured out a way to do it better. This was a future engineer. And that made standing in the heat and humidity for eight hours all worth it. Yeah, you know, if you get to one kid, you may not always know you got to a kid, but you're making a difference and it makes it all worth it. Right? Fabulous story, Connie. Uh, you know, so he really started to understand the engineering design process is what. Uh, Absolutely. So, so that's great. Uh, I think it, it, the key from, from all of your discussions and experiences is the hands-on, the activity that we want to be able to show the kids uh what engineering is all about so i think uh you know just sensing from your passion your your enthusiasm i know we're going to have a, a really informative session so why don't we start with uh going into kind of this case study and, and talking about maybe a particular program you'd like to share with our audience and stomatis i'll start with you is there is there a program that you've done that you probably would like to highlight and discuss that through the rest of our panel session. Yeah, I've done uh, many programs and uh, it's it's difficult to you know pick one because I I love all of them. They're my time, <laughs> they're my children. So um, I'd I'd just share uh, my my last one. It's called Life as a Fairy Tale, where uh, it's let's say like an uh, an enhanced taste. It's where we have uh, uh, a senior engineer uh, sharing his his life, his professional life, what what he did when he was professional, focusing on a on a technological innovation or a, uh, uh, something that that's really changed the uh, our lives, and this you know enhances so much the the 
sentin the, the, the sentience of the kids, it's, it, it really makes them feel what sort of a difference can an engineer do. Uh, and then we, of course, have a hands-on activity, which is, I think, uh, with, uh, what we all should have, because it's like telling a story of what it has to be done, and that story is what the kids remember. The hands-on activity to make the, uh, that's connected with um, this story, the, uh, the senior engineer um, was uh, describing. And you know what? In my last event, a, a, a girl came to me and said, this was the best day of my life. I will remember it for my whole life. And that gives me you know, fuel for keep going and keep doing this uh, again and again. Great. We'll be talking a little bit more about that as we as we go around the the panel. So, uh, Connie, I'll, I'll go to you next. Any particular program you'd like to share a little bit more about? Well, we don't do a specific program other than Civil Air Patrol, but we do a series of activities. I noticed uh, in the chat one of my partners in crime, Bob Johnson. Bob Johnson and Catherine Gray and I are kind of like the terrible trio of Chicago STEM. Uh, we search out activities, venues, any place that we can do a STEM presentation and do STEM activities. In fact, we've even done STEM activities at Chicago Wolves hockey games. And we've had uh, different STEM exhibits out in the corridor and between sessions of the hockey game, the kids would come out and talk to us. And there's no end to the places. I mentioned Taste of Chicago. We've done Park District. Um, literally anybody that has a, a spare few minutes on their stage, we go in and grab and set up a STEM activity because a lot of kids don't come out to the what they think is a traditional egghead brainiac stem venue so we bring fun stuff to kids and show them you don't have to be number one in the class you just want to be curious and have fun and we bring that to them to wherever the kids are whether it's a park or a church basement or the chicago wolves hockey games we go to them and we show them how much engineering can impact their lives and how much fun it is. Oh, fabulous. I, I think that is a great uh, piece of advice that trying to do STEM wherever the opportunity comes about. And it doesn't have to be at, at a, you know, at a library doing something at a hockey game or something like that, where, is, you know, is a really exciting approach. So, so we'll talk more about that. Uh, Cheryl, how about you? What uh, would you like to share about a particular STEM program you've worked on? Yeah, sure. Um, I would like to share with you an event hosted jointly by IEEE Malaysia and Ministry of Education to commemorate the IEEE TISC week in 2018, where we have trained about 400 teachers in eight parallel sessions and on four different tri engineering lessons robot arm, serial and parallel musical card, Arduino and blink, uh, Arduino blink and more, and nano piano to match the content of the new subject uh, that is the design and technology subject. So, to empower the teachers and to facilitate it and also to guide uh, their students. I'm grateful to have gotten the approval from IEEE Malaysia and also the Ministry of Education on this collaboration. The Ministry of Education provided uh, venues, refreshment and science teachers. And while the IEEE Malaysia provided uh, STEM volunteers, um, secretariat, materials and logistics. And I was very lucky to get um, PECC to sponsor all the workshop materials. So on challenges, 
number one. Uh, do you want me to go on with the challenges or is it later? I'll ask you that a little bit later. Yep. Okay, right. Yes. That's all. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, Cheryl. And uh, Pia, uh, what uh, program would you like to share? Well, um, we have done several activities since uh, 2018, uh, where we created the program called Roboteam inside the Women in Argentina uh, group. Um, first, in the beginning, we have done several hands-on activities because we really value the experience of the, of the kids uh, touching the equipment, programming robots, and, and playing, and, and see how fun it is. But uh, during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we have to change the way we were doing the activities. And there started um, was born a uh, robot uh, STEM experience, which was um, an online uh, program where we reach kids from all over the country. We send them materials, uh, Arduino plaques with uh, sensors and, and all the devices to create a project a prototype they have to work in teams, uh, girls and boys uh, from uh, uh, 14 to 18 years old. And they have to create a project that will um, solve is a, a problematic, uh, an issue from their own communities. And they have to frame that solution in one of the sustainable development goals. Uh, it's the same idea. We want to um, let them feel that they are change makers, that they can use the technology to change the world. Uh, these are teenagers that are trying to decide which is going to be their future profession. And uh, in that way, we have reached um, around 100 kids during this year uh, with this program. It is amazing because we are not only uh, inspiring them uh, locally in Buenos Aires, where I live, we are also uh, inspiring them in, in the whole country. We have also volunteers in, in different provinces of Argentina. And this is a two months experience. This is a long program, but they learn a lot of about STEM, but they also are, they are learning about how to be leaders, how to work in teams, how to work in diverse teams, because they are from different backgrounds, from different uh, social uh, economic environments. And this is the idea. We want to focus in, in kids that they have uh, underserved, um, uh, they are from underserved communities. They don't have these kind of activities uh, back in home. They don't have uh, the opportunity to experience this because they don't have the resources, but maybe they don't have the, the, these kind of activities in their uh, communities. And we want them to uh, give this opportunity to learn and to learn also about other colleagues in the rest of the, of the country. Uh, till now, these teenagers, they, they told us that they want to study engineering, they want to study science. So we think they, we have accomplished our goal and we're really proud of this program because at the beginning of the pandemic, we thought it was impossible. But by the end, we have, two, uh, uh, we have done it twice this year and we are trying also to, to make it like a, a standing program in, in, our, in our project. Uh, we will know what happened with the COVID-19, but we have the tools to keep doing the STEM activities for our age. Oh, fabulous. That, that kind of leads me to, you know, maybe tie into the next question. You made a comment about, oh, maybe they, they want to choose science and not engineering. But again, I think that makes us successful. Even, you know, it's, it's, we're not trying to get them to go one path. Uh, there are many paths they can take. We're just trying to spark that interest. So that that's really great. So what I'm going to do now is kind of transition. You've you've talked a little bit about the program, and and based on that last comment from Pia, uh, you know when you're when you were planning this program, how did you come about deciding what to offer? I mean, because that's always I know volunteers always ask that. What should we offer them? So you know. Getting over that hump sometimes is the biggest challenge for for a volunteer who's going to do who's going to start a STEM program. So, Connie, I'll I'll start with you. What you know what what decision process does your section go through or you go through when you're trying to decide what type of program to offer? Well, we look at what can we do with the resources we have. Um, We've done things like run amateur radio classes and had ham radios available for the kids to play with. We've done classes where we have brought a bunch of fruit in and built uh, lemon batteries. Uh, something that we can engage the kids in where they can actually 
take something in their hands, do something, participate. We don't want to lecture. We want people engaged. And basically, if we have fun, they have fun. So we look at what do we have fun doing? And since we're all 16 at heart, what are the kids going to want to do? So it, it, it boils down to what can we afford, what materials we can get, and can we engage the students in, in the project? And are we going to have a lot of fun, or is it going to be a boring day? If it's going to be boring, on to the next activity. We want to have fun. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, that leads me to you, Cheryl. You talked about this big effort you had in Malaysia. And, you know, that sounds like a massive program that you, you know, reaching that many teachers. How did you make that decision to do something on such a large scale? Um, I don't know. <laughs> just, I just want to do it. <laughs> yeah. And to help the teacher so that they can facilitate and also guide the students. Um, which is our future, which will be, uh, you know, our future leaders. Did you have, uh, a, you know, any experience before that, before you tried doing something so large uh, to give you some lessons learned? Or was it a case where you, I know we're, we'll talk a little bit about challenges later, but was this a case where you, you didn't worry about that? You figured we'll do, you know, we'll learn as we go. Uh, no, um, I, you know, before that, I've been uh, doing the STEM activities with the schools at various schools um, on requests from the teachers. So, and I've been training uh, volunteers so that they can support me. And, and in the end, when I find I have enough workforce, and since the demand is there from the director of STEM, so I was just thinking, since this is IEEE Tips Week, why don't we make it, uh, you know, something uh, different? That's all. Very good. Thank you. Uh, okay. Pia, tell us a little bit about your decision process in, in what to offer and, and so on. Well, uh, it has been changing during, during the time. Uh, we started barely, very with a humble uh, project with uh, only 20 kids uh, doing some robotics and stuff. Uh, then we figured out we can go bigger. Uh, by the next year, we were doing these kind of activities for 120, 160 kids by the same time. And we were adding activities. Uh, we were using also the EDS, uh, EDS ETC uh, kits, the Lenko kits, also robots from um, um, Lego, um, programming activities, hands-on activities to, to build stuff. We were trying to offer as much activities we could for these kids. And also, uh, one month later, we were adding activities for parents and later on activities for uh, teachers. So it has grown like a monster. <laughs> Uh, I think we were uh, not conscious about the <laughs> the effort that could um, mean to us, uh, but I think the the best way to 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 approach this is with inspiration and having an amazing team. I have a a great team of volunteers that they, ha they have they have their they, they heart put in this project. They really believe that uh, STEM education is the future. Uh, I think this is the, the magic inside these kind of activities. Uh, we, you need a strong team of volunteers, very committed, very dedicated. And in this right. way, you can you can plan anything. Um, I, I, I cannot believe what, had, we, what we have done here. Uh, we are from Region 9. We are in Latin America. We don't have much access sometimes to resources, but we have managed to contact more than 20 companies that are, have supported us during the activities uh, since 2018. Uh, we have several uh, sponsorship from uh, several IEEE societies or groups or, or grants. So it is possible. Uh, I think the the first things you have to do is dream it. <laughs> you have to dream bigger and dream. try to maybe start smaller, but then uh, try to scale up and, and be happy in the process. Enjoy the process. 
Very good. I, I hope everybody out there who's watching is, is uh, they're taking notes because I've, I've been taking some notes already from all of you. I've uh, we've got some great concepts, great ideas here and great themes. So 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 far, it's been it's been very educational, even, you know, for for me. And I hope our audience feels the same way. And I do want to remind before I go on to Stamatis, I remind our audience, please share some of your experiences in the chat. Uh, how you got involved, what programs you've tried out, or, or if you, and again, if you have any questions for when we get to your audience, when we get to the audience questions, we'd love to hear from you. So I just wanted to bring that up. So, uh, uh, Stamata, so, you know, in terms of your decision-making process, what did, uh, what did you do? I know you, you have a lot, a big portfolio of programs. And so how do you determine which one to offer at any particular time? Well, basically, it's what our resources are and what we are able to do. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that I never, I never settle. I, I always try to research and make get better, make my programs better, etc. So when I when I uh, hold, uh, schedule a, a new event, there's always something new there, so that I want to test it, etc. I want everybody to have fun. That's a key element to have fun through this process. And I strongly believe, especially after what we are uh, witnessing in this pandemic, that having the mentality of an engineer, the, the, the logical thinking, the critical thinking, being able to recover from a failure and understand and go further should be uh, teached, I don't know, should be passed to all, all kids. It's it's essential, essential skills. It's, it's not it's not, you know, something uh, uh, that uh, we should keep for ourselves. It's essential skills that all, all kids and all teachers should, should have. So my decision process is, is based on that. So always test for something new, have fun, and try to let them understand how we engineers thinking and, and, and uh, engage them in, in that kind of thinking. And always the resources, <laughs> always. Right. What that's a, that's that's a great lead into the to the next question because you've all commented about in terms of your planning an event or an activity that you're trying to do it within the resources that you have available and and so that's kind of a, a two part question then you know when you're looking at some one of like the program you've highlighted you know how do you determine how to pay for it is it you know are you using some of your own internal sources. Are you trying to get? Are you trying to get some sponsorships? So, so that's one piece. It's a two-part question, everybody. So, so, uh, and the second part is you. You kind of all touched on it as well in terms of your volunteer support. Uh, you know, it's one thing to say money's probably the easier part when you're really thinking about it. Getting the people to actually help and execute that is probably. Uh, one of the more difficult challenges. So, so, in terms of of funding, in terms of volunteer support, Cheryl, how how did your how did you approach those things? Um, on funding wise, I'm very lucky because I have the support from the IEEB Malaysia section, uh, the minister, uh, the ministry uh, support, as well as uh, materials is always uh, weak. I, I think. The PECC always sponsored me with the workshop materials. And I also got some sponsorship from the companies as well. So that's really uh, not a problem. Um, well, for the volunteer wise, what I did is I, I sort of, uh, it, it's like uh, what they call domino effect. You train five volunteers and, you know, you, you encourage them to train uh, more volunteers under them. Because I can't do everything, you know, it just doesn't have the time. So uh, that's how I propagate uh, to increase the uh, number of volunteers. I also uh, try to advertise or promote the uh, EA activities, what we have done, the STEM activities in the section newsletters and also social media um, to arouse the interest um, of volunteers, you know, to bring in new volunteers. That's that's how I do it. Yeah. 
No, great. Thank you so much. That's very helpful. Uh, Pia, how about uh, your story in that in that regard? Well, as I mentioned before, um, sometimes we don't have uh, enough uh, local resources. So it was a huge job to um, approach companies, try to sell this idea that education is important, especially for um, companies, industries that are, are using technology nowadays. Uh, they need more engineers for working in their uh, companies. So the, the, we need to uh, inspire them that they, they need to invest in education if they want to have more employees in the future. Uh, that was a huge, a tremendous job, but fortunately these companies, um, ha they've got faith on us. Uh, they have uh, supported us in several programs in the last years, but sometimes the programs we have done, they are very expensive because we are sending uh, kids for the, each of the participants from, uh, to their homes. We have to invest in, in all the logistics that, that uh, it, it involves. Uh, so it is a expensive program, but we really believe it is a, a way to do it, especially in this during uh, this pandemic. Uh, once uh, one uh, part of the answer is that we have companies that are supporting us, and we have also the some um, incomes from uh, awards and, and grants that we request to IGP. Uh There are lots of opportunities in IGP. Uh, if you want to start a program, a STEM program, you have to do your research and you will find the funds. It's not the big deal, but you have to be, uh, you have to work on that. You have to invest some hours in that. And and it is uh, something that companies and organizations, they really believe this is a, a, a thing they have to do. So this is not a huge problem nowadays. About the volunteer, I agree with you that uh, it is sometimes uh, difficult to engage a team of people that they have to invest their hours after their work, after their studies uh, in these kind of programs, because the only uh, reward they have is the smile of a kid. This is a huge reward, but also it, uh, it, there are a lot of hours invested in, in these kind of programs. And also the volunteers, they have to understand they are kids. We have to be very respectful with them. We have to be very sure that we are um, considering all the security aspects when we are working with them. Uh, so sometimes the kids ask for an Instagram account or things like that, and we cannot share with that because they are minors and we don't have the, the permission from the parents. We cannot share the pictures. So there, there are a lot of legal aspects we have to take into account. So to train volunteers, not only in the technical part, also in the logistic and the administration part is very, very hard. And to get those volunteers involved during these years is even more harder. So I think the answer in this kind of issue is to try to create this sense of belonging to this uh, program. I try to reward them in, in different ways. Uh, I can have write, uh, for example, recommendation letters for a job for a volunteer. I have um, done some um, uh, partnership with uh, academics that provide free courses, for example, English courses or or technical tools um, courses for free for our volunteers. Try to give them something else uh, that uh, really um, make them feel that they are part of the team and they are accomplishing a lot of things. And please tell your volunteers to write down in the resume that they are part of the volunteer because this is very important nowadays for a job. And um, I, I try to do as much as I can for my volunteers because I know they are the heart of the program. So this is the focus I have because I know without my volunteers, the program will not exist. So I think this is the biggest um, thing you have to consider to try to them, make them happy, engaged and, and with the heart in the right place. Very good. I, I agree. They are the heart of the program. So, 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 uh, Stamatis, your last comment kind of kicked this off. So, so money and volunteers. How do you approach that? Well, when the program is uh, the, uh, the event is held in a in a local you know community, you can always find help there. If, if funding, sponsoring, volunteers, etc. Of course, I should please always uh, there to help us uh, in in that kind of uh, matter. So, yeah. In, when the, the times were normal and we had we didn't have a pandemic, we were planning the event early enough so that we get into the marketing budget of some you know companies, and it was just fine. Now that you plan the event for the next month or next week, it's a bit you know difficult. But uh, yeah, local community can always help, and of course, most of the most of the. Uh, 
hands-on activities are really cheap to to implement them. The, the materials are, are really cheap, so uh, even the participants can afford them if if, the, if they like. Mm -hmm. Regarding the volunteers, this is the the, the critical question of, <laughs> of this. I mean, it's a huge thing because everyone has his different approach on that. Uh, everyone has uh, different uh, goals by being a volunteer. Others want, want to serve back, others want to uh, re be recognized, etc. I think the key element is to respect them, to have fun, and to let them understand what they gain other than what they have thought of, like, yeah, uh, uh, completing their, uh, improving their CV, having fun when they, they see the results of their, their uh, efforts, I mean, I've seen volunteers who were trying to just promote themselves, and when they finally got to the event and saw the, 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 the shining eyes of the kids, they forgot everything. They said, this is, this is what I was volunteering for. So just respect them, listen to them, let them understand what, what they can get out of it, and have fun. And always refer to the student branches, they got a lot of... Uh, STEM volunteers to, to provide, of course. Um, that's, I had another one in my mind, but I it passed. <laughs> I forgot about it. Well, we can come back. Very good. Yeah. Thank you, Stamatis. Connie, how about on your end? Uh, any any other insights related to money and volunteers? Well, on the volunteer front, absolutely student branches are full of people who want to get out of the dorm and do something and they're closer in age to their our target audience and by definition they're going to be paid attention to a lot more than us old folks so recruit your students in fact i'm reminded um last friday was our um, we leadership conference and one of the panelists was suzanne tedrick who was one of my student volunteers on STEM activities back in Chicago. She's now written a book, works for IBM. And so, you know, a lot of times you've got really good STEM talent in your students. Uh, another area to look is as you do activities, look at the parents. You're gonna find that a lot of the parents were student branch members back in the day. Um, maybe they were in a different section and they moved and they never reconnected or they didn't realize that IEEE existed. They went to a school that didn't have a student branch and they didn't know about us. Recruit the parents and there's nothing more committed than a parent whose kids are involved in an activity. So trying to recruit parents at activities is important. Another place that you might not consider is other engineering organizations and other engineering groups. Mm -hmm. I mentioned my friends Bob and Catherine, and Bob is in our chat today. The three of us, if one of us doesn't know about a STEM activity in Chicago, it's probably not worth knowing about <laughs> because we, we all find out about it and then we put our heads together and come up with a way that we can do a great activity. In terms of funding, we're great beggars. We beg from everybody. We go to companies and if you tell a company, hey, you can put a banner up at our table that says materials provided by XYZ company. Um, we have a thing here, um, it's in the United States. I don't know if there are similar uh, activities called uh, the STEM uh, Pathways Coalition. And it's a group of funders, providers, and users. And we find um, people who are willing to, uh, to put in some money uh, in that group. Uh, some of it comes from our section or our project bu uh, budgets within IEEE. And one thing we try to do for our volunteers is see if we can carve out a few dollars here and there and give them things like jackets, you know, windbreakers and polo shirts where we can identify them as an IEEE volunteer. And it's 
you know, maybe we paid 15 bucks for a t-shirt, but that volunteer is going to feel good and come back. And we give those not only to our student volunteers, but to our adult volunteers as well. So when you go to an activity and you uh, look at the IEEE group, you'll see us all adorned in um, a t-shirt or a windbreaker that identifies IEEE. And there are companies where if you watch their sales, you can get really good deals. Like you can get um, six windbreakers for $100, which is not a bad deal if you've ever bought a windbreaker at a commercial store. And it'll be embroidered or printed with IEEE. And um, my, my polo shirt actually says, try engineering on it. Oh, and, nice. <laughs> And it says, uh, try engineering IEEE advancing technology for humanity. And if nothing else, my, my polo shirt starts a conversation. But people who are at our activities see these things and they say, hey, what's that all about? And so there are little things you can do to both get funding and get volunteers. But keeping people involved and making them feel like they, they want to be involved and like they're actually doing something worthwhile. And that is, it isn't a waste of four hours on Saturday or two hours on Saturday or however long it takes. But the identification, as I've learned from other organizations, when you identify as a group and you have like wear that you come to, to an activity as a group wearing the same thing, not only does it give you something called a spree decor which is basically a good feeling about what your organization is doing and what you're doing. If you can engender esprit de corps, uh, you can have that, that enthusiasm uh, bleeds over into the kids you're talking to. Very good. No, two, two uh, really great pieces of advice there about the student branches and parents as well as, the, as additional sources. Uh, I'm watching the clock. I know we're... It's hard to believe we've been talking for almost an hour now. Uh, so I want to close out this session, this part of the panel with just two quick questions. I'll, I'll do them one at a time as we'll go around. Uh, uh, and the first one is about the, the challenges. Uh, can you, you know, start, touch briefly on the challenges you've encountered, uh, one or two, and maybe how you, how you approached and solved those? So Pia, I'll start with you. Okay, well, uh, I think the, the biggest challenge was to change the way we were doing activities, uh, pass, um, transform the hands-on activities to virtual activities during the pandemic. That was a, a huge problem, um, uh, but it was uh, solved because the, the team of volunteers, they have this uh, urgency to, to give back to community. Uh, most of us, we were scared because of the virus. We were um, we were ha having fear about our families if we want to get COVID. Uh, also fear about our jobs because it was a very hard situation, especially here in Argentina and in, in the rest of the globe as well. But I think the, the, the power of the volunteers, again, was the solution for this, uh, to change the, the way we were doing things. and and. Uh, I think we have uh, this um, skill set as in engineers to create something from scratch. One and uh, many times to start again, to start over, to learn from our mistakes, uh, to to create new things. So with this spirit of, of building things, to creating things, um, we have overcome this very difficult time. And now we are starting thinking how we are going to do this now hybrid activities. Um, the learning from this change was uh, from these uh, virtual activities, we have the opportunity to reach not only kids from Argentina, also from all over Latin America. And that was huge because we haven't considered that since uh, before the pandemic. So that was a, a huge change. It was hard. But, but by the end, nowadays, I can see that that was a success also. There was an opportunity. So again, as an engineer, learn from opportunities and just start uh, thinking about the next steps. I think that's a, it's a great point. And it's a, it's, in a way, it's a funny point that sometimes we forget we are engineers. Yeah. <laughs> and we have the skills. To we have the skill set. Yes, yes, to build. So very good. 
Stamatis, uh, challenges that you have overcome? Yeah, you know, the, the, um, the most common problem when I, uh, I face when I uh, hold an event is convincing the parents that this is not just having fun, but it's actually something really important and, and teaches their kids uh, STEM. I mean, cutting uh, straws, etc. Cetera, in, in the parents' eye, it seems like uh, nonsense. You know? So we, we, we have to train our volunteers, and that is the way I do it. We train them so that they understand what exactly the method is, what, what STEM is, how important it is, and how much it teaches the kids. Not just technical skills, but also non-technical skills, which, which are extremely important. So, yeah, another, another very interesting uh, idea is involving those parents in the, in the uh, program, like Connie said. Yeah, that might be a solution that I, I never thought of. They, they, I, I, you know, uh, perceive them as uh, clients, not part of the of the uh, of the program. So yeah, uh, this is my uh, always my my biggest fear that the, the the kids or the the teachers will come and the parents would say, oh, what are you doing? This is not necessary. I always try to train my volunteers to convince them that this is important, and this is the way that education should be in a few years or as soon as possible. Thank you so much for that. Yes, absolutely. Connie, uh, anything on your end related to the challenges? Well, obviously the pandemic was a huge challenge because it really stifled hands-on activity. But what the pandemic has given us is a humongous library of presentations that are stored and available on demand. For example, my YouTube channel has resources for teachers and volunteers and even students. Um, my Bob's channel has hands-on activities that people can do at home. So we never thought to record any of this earlier, but now we have this library of almost two years of virtual activities that people can call up and say, hey, I want to hear about what I can do with an engineering degree. Oh, here's it on, on, on Connie's YouTube channel. There's a whole presentation on the impact of engineering degrees. Or what can I do with my, my class? There, there, there's, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm out of ideas and, and there are things and I can't figure out what to do with these kids virtually. Well, I can go and look at Connie's resource presentation on her YouTube channel and see um, oh, there's these contests, there's essay contests, there's computer-based contests that the kids can do at home. And so we've built a huge resource library that's not going to go away when the pandemic ends. It will be, in, it'll enrich our hands-on activities. And these will be around, you know, as long as the web has hosting, I guess. But it's something that's there, it's free, and anybody can access all of the uh, the wonderful presentations. And I, I might add, um, in November, um, Chicago and Region 4 is hosting an activity on uh, at something called eBlocks and how they were designed. Think Legos meets Snab Circuits. <laughs> And we're gonna talk about the design process and how they're used, and also how they can be used to get kids excited about uh, getting involved in engineering thought processes in the earlier years. And I know having a, a presentation on toys is probably not something most uh, sections think about, but when you think about it, learning the engineering process about a toy is one of the most basic things you can do. So come to IEEEChicago.org and register and come visit and, and, and learn about uh, how to design toys. Great. 
Absolutely. Uh, I think you're you're right on about the fact that, you know, sometimes challenges are opportunities. And the pandemic was a good example of that, that uh, it, it, it did create new ways for us to operate and and draw on some other things we never thought about. So so I think everyone out there should think be thinking about that. So, Cheryl, I'll close out with you uh, uh, in terms of any ch the challenges that you've encountered when organizing your program. Um, it's it's not uh, not really with conducting the uh, uh, sort of program, but um, at some STEM events, I took an interest to look at some of the STEM kits sold by companies. And I, I have a little bit of concern uh, that uh, whether the volunteers recognize that it is the journey and not the end product that nurture creativity. Um, the same sparks that from the firing neuron network of some engineers that put together the Delta robot, uh, who, who serve food to the self-isolated COVID-19 patient um, at some remote villages in Indonesia by put by using the discarded pot and pans, TV monitors, and some household items. Um, I hope the volunteers will look into try engineering, uh, try engineering lessons more, because I, f I find it has the ingredients that ignite that spark in us, and they use cheap materials or so. So we, 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 we shouldn't do find the shortcut, you know, to the uh, STEM activities. Very and good. also sometimes in conducting the workshop, we do hear or we get being asked why I am here, why, what am I doing here and things like that, you know. So I think that an introduction at the beginning of the workshop is necessary to uh, captivate the attention like it would be nice to associate the stem topic with theories in their school uh, book and also its impact to the real world for example the wind energy lesson can be related to the uh, newton law of forces and also conservation of energy and if they can be made to realize that the blade or thingy that they are to design has an impact on the airflow volume from the ceiling fan or the stand fan at their home, the amount of electricity electricity generated from the wind farm, and also the amount of workload uh, produced by the windmill, I think they will be answer uh, to themselves of why I should be here and giving their like attention full heartedly and willingly but one of the problem challenge that i cannot solve is uh this is from the teacher as eager as they are to recreate the uh, stem activities in their classroom there is no allocation on the timetable for that mm. now how do we help them right yeah. Uh, maybe we can address that uh, as we get into the questions. That's a really important, it's a really important question. Uh, as we close out, I'd just like to close out this case study session. Uh, and it ties into one of the questions that I saw asked. So uh, everybody out there, please put, put your questions in so we can start uh, uh, addressing that to the panel. But as we close out, uh, the question I saw talked about how do you measure success? And I know that my own experiences in professional societies and full disclosure, everybody, I'm a mechanical engineer <laughs> and spent a lot of my time with the with ASME. And I know from both organizations, ASME, IEEE and other associations, we used to think of success as let's hold an event. And if we hold the event, that's success. But we realize if our goal here is to inspire, whether it's to help teachers bring engineering into their classroom, whether to get students to see that engineering and technology could be for them, 
or helping parents navigate all the resources that they that are, that are out there to help them uh, uh, bring engineering to their kids. What, in terms of your programs, uh, do you do to measure success? And 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 I know that we can probably talk a little bit, a lot about this, obviously, because uh, but uh, it's it is an important aspect. So I'll start with you, Stamatis. Uh, what what measures have you used? Well, I'd say. It depends. It depends on what your goals are. I mean, and this is this is crucial because you have to set your goals. They have to be clear in your mind what your goals are. Otherwise, you will feel like you haven't succeeded whatever you do, because someone will tell you, "Was it? Was the pedagogical impact enough? Was the uh, uh, outreach enough? Was whatever everyone has in his mind? Our goals have to be really clear." And depending on these goals, you can you can measure or not. The, the, some, some things are really difficult to measure, like, for example, the long-term impact of your uh, events. What I usually am happy with is when, I'm, uh, when I, I uh, see the, 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 the faces of the kids smiling, I, I know that they really are engaged in this. Like, for example, the, this, this kid I told you about, that this girl that told me this is, is it success to, to have a one out of 25 participants saying, this is the best day of my life. I will remember it forever. I guess it is. And of course, when, you know, uh, parents, uh, schools, organizations requesting to uh, do another event and another event and another event. Uh, of course, we are, we are uh, sharing um, questionnaires to be, uh, you know, uh, answered by the participants and their parents or, or the educators, etc. But you know, sometimes these are biased, and, and um, I don't. I uh, we always, uh, you know, approach them in a in a qualitative uh, way, not not so you know uh, quantitative because. Yeah, they, they don't want to, if, if they have something negative, they don't want to, you know, uh, make us sad and they don't write it down. So it's, 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 it's a bit difficult approach. But my, my, I think the, the, the criteria that never failed was the, the attitude after the, the event when, of the kids, of, the, of those that participated and those that uh, were in the process, even the volunteers. Even the volunteers, and I remembered what I forgot before. It's trust. You have to. Uh, the, the volunteers have to trust you that you will not abuse them or etc. Their, their time. I mean, so since the, when the volunteers are happy about that, and also the the participants, and they they call you to repeat it again and again, then I think is the way I feel success. Very good. Thank you so much on that one. Connie, I'll, I'll turn to you uh, to get your perspective. Well, a good way is repeat attendees. If you repeat an activity and you see the same faces year after year, that's a, a, a good indicator that you're getting through. Uh, a lot of times if you're doing a, uh, a local radio or a television program that has call-ins, if you're getting a lot of call-ins and a lot of questions, and a lot of follow-ups are forwarded to you after the fact. Um, and a lot of times, you'll see people that you had had met when they were seven, eight, nine years old, and you'll meet them in a high school or a college context, and they're in pre-engineering and going into engineering courses. And I actually had a, a young lady walk up to me in Cleveland Hopkins Airport and say, you don't remember me. But when I was a freshman at IIT, you talked to our class about girls should stick it out in engineering, and we had a real future. And I'm an engineer now, and I'm here to visit such and such a company. And I didn't remember this girl, but she remembered me and walked across the airport to say hello. So there, there are ways that, that you get, uh, get uh, feedback. And a lot of times, as you work with student branches, you'll get students who said, hey, I remember you from. And if you have a YouTube channel or if your section has a website, a lot of times you'll get comments back there. And pay attention to the comments because they tell you what you need to do next. 
and you, you get a lot of good feedback that way. And you'd be surprised. There are students that I worked with decades ago, back in the 80s, even before that, that I still hear from. And I, I had taught students how to do a little trick with their hands to remember uh, different um, different torsion torsion bending and and uh, a whole different uh, series of stresses and i once got a phone call at three in the morning from a young lady who was in college 400 miles away who said that little trick you showed us with your hands about how to remember all the different uh, torsion bending different stress methods of uh, and we had a test and I was the only one who got it right and I was the only perfect score and they just posted our scores and I couldn't wait to tell you. At uh, three in the morning, me, Connie? <laughs> you couldn't wait until 10 or something. You had to call me at three in the morning. <laughs> but so you do make a difference. You may not realize it and you may not get that phone call in the middle of the night or that kid that walks up to you in the airport, but you're having an effect. Just see all those kids who are showing up in engineering school and in engineering and science and math and other technology curriculum. And just see those kids who are showing up locally and you know you've made a difference. Now, I think what you and Stamana said there uh, about that, that individual uh, satisfaction and, and enormous satisfaction that comes when, when you see you've touched, uh, you know, you've, you've impacted a, a, a student and and uh, you know you've had that they come back and they tell you about that that's a great 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 stories uh cheryl uh, in terms of your programs uh, what have you used to measure success um well i'm i'm not sure at the um sort of uh, higher level i mean uh when i see the statistics on um you know um the, the science streams, the, the, the populations of science streams in high school and also universities has increased, or even the uh, position of maths and science subject in the OECD report for Malaysia has risen. I mean, that shows me that the teachers are sort of uh, propagating the uh, uh, you know, the interest in um, science and engineering to the students. So I guess that's a, a yardstick for success. Um, but on personal level, um, your feet, say, are numb from standing, uh, your sweat are dripping from running around, and your mouth is dry and your head is pounding from you know, answering question after question after question and so on. Yet having faith that at least one, even one, out of that group of Gen Z, Gen Alpha, or the teachers has gained an appreciation for what engineer and technology professionals do and how their work impact the real world and thus become excited with a STEM career. The numbness, the sweatiness, the dryness, the pounding, just give way to a personal satisfaction of share, give back, inspire. And I think that is what I call success. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> And Pia, we'll close out with you on this yeah. topic, and then we'll start taking some questions from the audience. Perfect. So I have a lot of uh, indicators and KPIs. Sorry, I'm very square. I'm a project manager, <laughs> so I, I love to measure things. <laughs> so uh, one of the well, things we do to measure success is to conduct surveys, of course. We conduct surveys for the parents, for the kids, and also for the volunteers. Let me know, let me tell you that the most honest uh, surveys are from the kids because they don't have a problem to tell you that your program sucks. <laughs> they, they, they are going to be very honest. They are going to tell you, the, I like this, but I didn't like this. We ask them, for example, which of the activities they like the most. Uh, we ask them if they will refer, refer the program to other kids. 
And these are the, the pure uh, information we really need to have to improve our, our program. And we also ask them what they want us to add to the program. And this is very interesting because they have amazing ideas. And with these ideas, we create better programs as well in the future. Other things that I, I like to have to measure the success if is when a brother or a sister from a previous participant want to participate in the program when they get to the age that is able to uh, for them to participate. Also, I have another success stories from uh, parents and aunts uh, that are, were uh, being, bringing their kids to the programs and now, that nowadays they are very good volunteers. They're part of our team because they want to give back the opportunities we provided for their kids. And this is also an amazing way to say we were so successful. Uh, another thing is um, when we receive not maybe a call, but maybe an email from the uh, previous uh, participants saying they want to start engineering or science. And again, I have a success story from these years. Uh, I have six female participants that were part of our programs. They didn't know anything about engineering. They didn't know how to uh, use an Arduino board or even which is an LED. They didn't know anything. And nowadays they are participating sponsored by us and we are mentoring them in a global robotics competition. Five, six girls. So I can say I can I could inspire at least six girls doing this last several years and it was amazing and it's a huge and tremendous success for us. And uh, last but not least, when when you, the companies, the sponsors, other organizations approach to you, and you don't need to go outside and knock the doors. This is also a way to uh, measure success because they are they know your program, they, they know that this is a strong program. They, they know that this is it's making an impact uh, they want to be part of. So this is a very good way to measure as well if you are doing a good job. And I have a, 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 many other stories about gender equality. We have more uh, application from girls nowadays. We have more success about projects leading by girls. Um, but this is a long story, so we, <laughs> we try to be as, as short as possible. But it is important to measure as well to be to see, to be sure that you are making an impact and how can you improve in the future editions of your activities. No, oh, thank you so much. It's a great way to to close out the, the session. And uh, for those of you that are listening, I know we've, you know, we have been looking at uh, assessment impact this, the, over the course of the last uh, two years, really, uh, as we put the STEM portal together and you know getting data from the people who are doing these activities is critical for us to actually demonstrate the impact ieee is having so you know we are we are trying to do our best uh to get the regular metrics as pia was talking about you know how many attended you know how many teachers how many parents how many students uh and so on but as both pia and stamana has also said about the attitudes and you know, did we did they learn something? And, and doing a survey is pretty critical. So, so a lot of those resources are on the STEM portal. Uh, I thank you all for that great discussion, the case study, and talking about your programs and and all of the aspects that influence it. Let us now uh, open it up and see if we have some questions uh, from the audience uh, because we are running out of time. Okay, I see a question there from Murray. So uh, uh, thank you for so many great proven ideas. Uh, thanks for sharing. Agree that assessment is very difficult. What are your thoughts on surveying any observers, such as teachers or parents, a week after the events? Uh, interesting idea. I don't know if anyone would like to tackle that. Pia? Yes, sure. I was trying to put uh, my thoughts together. Okay. Yes, I think uh, it is important to survey as, as sooner as possible because uh, otherwise the most of the feelings of the experience will be lost. Um, I think it is important to um, survey them in, it, sometimes it's difficult in a quantitative way because they are very uh, small. We don't know if maybe in 10 years they're going to choose engineering, but maybe we can ask the kids, for example, if they now they know more about engineering or, or the specific tool they were using during the workshop or, or how they are feel using that or what they can do maybe with open questions uh, what, what they can use this tool for or, or maybe I, I like to do this question uh, are you feeling that you are a change maker nowadays with engineering with technology this is an open question, but this is, a, again, uh, talking about the feelings, the, 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 the spirit we were creating during these programs. 
as well the same with teachers or parents. Uh, we need the, the, the feedback as soon as possible to try to adjust the program. And it is also a huge job to take all the information together and, and try to um, create a, a future plans, a, a step by step to, to increase, to do a, a cycle of a continuous improvement. So do it as, as soon as, as possible. Try to try to do open and close questions. Quantitative and qualitative questions are, are good try to do as much as I can, um, but try also to not to be a long survey because it's going to be boring and most of the kids are not going to answer it. Very good. And just try to put the last question, uh, an open question, say, what do you want to um, say about the program? What, what would you do, like to be improved in, 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 in further editions, for example? This is very good. Thanks, Pia. Uh, anyone else like to add anything? I think there's one. We do have one more question in the queue. Well, at, at activities, it's always helpful to have one person who has no job other than to talk to the people who are coming through saying, how did you feel? What, what could we do better? How did you like it? So as, you know, as an activity is actually being run, uh, see how many of the people who are there at the exhibit or at the activity that uh, that you can question, uh, and you know it can't be a really long, you know, one or two questions on how do you feel? Are you getting anything out of this? Would you come back and leave it at that and go on to the next person? But if you get them as they're there, sometimes you get uh, you know a raw emotion. Very good. Uh, let's see. Do we have another question? I think. Uh... That might be it. Okay. Well, I think we're just about out of time. So uh, it's been a, a, everybody, it has been a, a, a great conversation. Uh, I really want to thank uh, Pia and Stamanis and Cheryl and Connie, number one, for all they do for IEEE, for all they do for the profession. Uh, you're an inspiration. And also thank you so much for your efforts to support what we're doing in STEM outreach. And it's it's really a pleasure to work with such dedicated uh, individuals like yourselves. So I, I thank you for taking the time to join us today and share your experiences. I also would like to do a shout out uh, to uh, Donna Schultz and Lynn Bowlby, uh, my two, st two staff colleagues who have done just an amazing job, yes, putting putting this STEM summit together. It's, it's been a, I know we've got two more days to go and they're tired, uh, but they've been doing an amazing job and thank them for their, their amazing efforts. And also thank our PECC chair, uh, Pre-University Education Coordinating Committee Chair, Lorena Garcia, whose leadership and vision has led to this STEM summit. So uh, we thank you, Lorena, for all of you, you have done to to actually move the needle for us with STEM outreach in 2021. And so for everybody out there, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we've got two more days to go, uh, tomorrow's session and also the build out session on Saturday. I hope you can join us. Make sure you stop by the expo. There is a lot of great information there and feel free to reach out to any of us uh, if you have any questions about STEM outreach what you're doing is so important for the future of the profession. And, you know, we want to, we, we, I, I think Pia made a, a comment about the uh, change agents. We want to turn these kids into change agents. So we're doing that as well. We're changing and putting them on a certain path. So uh, it's, it's, to me, there's nothing better than working with students and inspiring them, uh, whether I was doing it at ASME or now with IEEE. So, uh, I thank you all, and hopefully you found today's session really informative and valuable. So wishing everyone again, uh, I guess we're in the afternoon here on the East Coast, but for those on the West Coast, a, a good morning, a good afternoon, and for those in the other time zones, a, a good evening, and uh, have a great weekend ahead uh, starting on Saturday. So thank you. We, we do hope to see you tomorrow and Saturday uh, for the other sessions. Take care, everybody. Bye, thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye. -bye.